In this lecture, we are going to cover chapter 7, which is the last bit of behavior of proteins. Specifically, we are going to focus on enzyme regulation and the mechanisms that they utilize in order to accomplish some conversions from substrate to product. In the last uh, lecture, we learn about enzyme inhibitors. Now, when it comes to regulation of enzymes, understand that there's four types that you guys need to be familiar with, including allosteric regulation, feedback regulation, phosphorylation, and cymogens. In the last chapter, we discuss what allosteric site means. As a review, remember that allosteric refers to the regulation of an enzyme by binding an effector molecule at a site that is different from the active site of the enzyme. Now, specifically when we were mentioning uh, the idea of, for example, a non-competitive inhibitor, we were talking about a regulation that includes repression. Because what happens is that if we have a repressor, it binds allosterically to the enzyme, it changes the shape of the active site, so now the enzyme cannot produce product. Now, one of the things that we should be familiar with, even though there's very few examples out there, is that enzymes can also be changed, but instead of being repressed, they can be activated. So when they're signaling molecules that activate a particular enzyme, what activators do is that they change the shape of the active site such that now the substrate can bind and it can produce product. So understand that enzymes can be regulated allosterically, but it can lead to not only repression, but also activation. The next type of regulation that you guys need to be familiar with is feedback regulation. And one of the things um, that we're going to be exploring, especially when we get to metabolism, is that many pathways um, in metabolism utilize this type of regulation in order to control and to gauge what to do depending on the environment of the cell. The main idea of feedback regulation, which is also known as negative feedback regulation is that the final product produced in an enzymatic reaction is going to go back and inhibit the first few steps in the series of catalytic events that have to happen to its productions. The reason why feedback regulation is very useful is because it prevents the accumulation of intermediates in a pathway. The third type of regulation that we have is phosphorylation. When it comes to phosphorylation, understand that the side chains that are affected are those that contain a hydroxyl group. So groups like serine, threonine, and tyrosine, when they get phosphorylated, are going to form a phosphate, a phosphate ester bond. So understand that phosphorylation are going to be utilizing ATP as a substance to obtain that phosphate. And understand that when it comes to phosphorylation, it can activate an enzyme. Or it can deactivate an enzyme. So it depends on what the system needs. The enzymes themselves that are going to be catalyzing these reactions are known as kinases. And they are going to be transferring a phosphate from ATP to the substrate and forming that phospho phosphate ester bond. The next type of regulation is going to be cymogens. So understand that there's at times uh, enzymes that are going to be 
controlling or are going to be controlling how we activate certain molecules or certain proteins in the body. Okay. So understand that in the case, just to give you guys an example of something that it is uh, con being controlled by enzyme activity, the production of insulin is a type of protein that is controlled by cymogens. Okay. Understand that cymogens need a biochemical change in order to be now active. So in the case of insulin being produced, a molecule that is called pro-insulin is going to be the first molecule in the pathway. So pro-insulin is going to be activated by peptide by enzymes called peptidases. And these peptidases, understand that are going to be cleaving pro-insulin into insulin. And that's how that protein is produced. And that connecting peptide is what kept it silent. Lastly, we are going to talk about the different types of catalytic mechanisms. Even though the textbook has a discussion on other types, you guys are responsible for knowing acid-base catalysis, covalent catalysis, and metal ion catalysis. So when it comes to general acid-base catalysis, as you can see, we're going to have amino acids being involved in acid-base reactions. So what that means is that we are going to have proton transfers. The side chain of amino acids that are present in these active sites more often are going to be aspartic acid, glutamic acid, histidine, lysine, arginine, cysteine, tyrosine. So to give you guys an example of a general acid-based catalysis, I'm going to be utilizing the isomerization of dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. As you can see, this reaction is going to happen in three parts. On step one, what is going to be happening is that if we look at the flow of work for the different amino acids that are present in that active site, there are two residues that we need to pay attention to, which is glutamic acid 165 and histidine 95. In this mechanism specifically, we can see how that glutamate in the glutamic acid is going to extract a proton from the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So that means that the glutamic acid in this first step is going to be acting as a base. In addition to that, the oxygen atom in our dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be receiving a proton from histidine. So that means that in this first step also histidine will be involved and if its role is going to be act or is going to be acting as an acid. These proton exchanges are going to lead to the formation of the ene diol intermediate. On step two, as you can see, even though it's not labeled, I'm just going to relabel them. We have glutamic acid 165 on the left and histidine 95 on the right. So as you can see, in this step, glutamic acid 165 is not involved. On step two, what we have specifically is going to be our histidine 95 is going to extract a proton from our ene diol intermediate. So that means that is going to be acting as a base. And then is going to be producing this intermediate. Okay. Now, if we go back and label the carbon atoms as we have in the first molecule, adding one, two, and three, in the last step of the reaction, as you guys can see, and I'm just going to relabel those residues. This is glue 165 and this is his 
95. Okay. The last step of the reaction, what we have is that glutamic acid 165 is going to be donating a proton to our intermediate that was formed from step two. So that means that in this instance, that glutamic acid is going to be acting as an acid so we can produce the product glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The next type of catalysis that you guys need to be familiar with is covalent catalysis. As you can see, a covalent in covalent catalysis it involves the formation of a transient covalent bond between a substrate and the residues that are present in the active site. The side chains of amino acids that participate in these type of catalysis include, and not limited to, but these are the ones that are seen more often, is histidine, cysteine, aspartic acid, lysine, and serine. Understand that the main thing that you should know is that these different side chains for those amino acids are going to be acting as nucleophiles. To illustrate this, we are going to be looking at the following example. So, in the example that is explained on A, this is going to be the reaction that is catalyzed by acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase, as you can see in part A, takes acetylcholine and it creates acetic acid and choline. So the reaction that we see, uh, its mechanism on uh, the part B of the figure has two steps. And we are going to outline what is happening in those two steps. Now, the important residues that we have here are Again, glutamic acid 334, histidine 447, and lastly, serine 203. Understand that the first three letters is the three-letter code for the amino acid. The second one is the number, meaning the location of that amino acid in the protein. So that's what that means, just in case. So, <clears throat> as you guys can see, we see some dotted lines that are going to be present in between some of these residues, specifically between glutamic acid or glutamate, okay, and histidine, and also between histidine and the hydrogen in the serine. So I want you guys to um, think about what does... Uh, <clears throat> Do the dotted lines represent? Think attractive forces, okay? So as you can see, in this first step of the reaction, we have the oxygen in the serine doing a nucleophilic attack. onto the carbon in the carbonyl in the ac uh, acetyl part of the acetylcholine. So this group that I'm going to highlight in red, okay? So that's the acetyl group. So again, the oxygen in the serine is going to be attacking the carbon in the carbonyl in that acetyl group, okay? So in step one, we form the choline, which you, I'm going to just circle the molecule. So we produce the choline. And as you can see, <clears throat> because that oxygen and the serine attack the carbonyl in the acetyl group of acetylcholine, now I'm just going to highlight it in red. This is where we form that transient Covalent bond. Okay. In the second step of the reaction, as you can see, and I'm just going to highlight it in blue, 
we have a water molecule that is going to be hydrolyzing the bond that was created <clears throat> in this process, which specifically that is an ester bond that is getting hydrolyzed. And as you can see, after this hydrolysis event, we're going to form the acetic acid and serine still has the OH. The last type of catalysis that you guys need to be familiar with is metal ions as catalyst. So understand that metal ions participate in the catalytic process in three major ways. The first way is that it binds the substrates in order to properly orient them in the reaction. They also are going to be mediating oxidation reduction reactions, as you can see through reversible changes in the metal ions oxidation state. Lastly, they are going to be electrostatically stabilizing or at times shielding negative charges. So they are going to be stabilizing the transition state of the substrate. As an example of a metal ion catalyst, we are going to be using alcohol dehydrogenase. So alcohol dehydrogenase is going to do the reduction of an aldehyde. In this case, acetaldehyde all the way to a primary alcohol. And the primary alcohol in this case is ethanol. As you guys can see, the metal ion catalyst in this case is zinc. So when we look at what is zinc doing in this process, as you can see, it is stabilizing the negative charge. in the transition state. For the molecules that is produced during this catalytic event.